Hello, hello, hello. It is me, it is me, your True Hill Phenom, SP3, back once again, True Hills BTR with Impact Lead Commentator Tom Hannafin. Nice to meet you. Great to have you. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. We're uh, we're on the heels of Hard to Kill 2023, which is awesome. We're on the road to No Surrender, Friday, February 24th in Las Vegas. We, we are always phenomenal live, so I had a blast at Hard to Kill in Atlanta, and we're going to do the same thing in Vegas, man. And I got to say, congratulations, because Hard to Kill marked uh, one year for you with Impact Wrestling, kind of looking back on the past year, coming in in January 2022, and having this huge show, Hard to Kill, in my opinion, one of the best Impact Wrestling shows that I've seen in quite some time, you know, headlined with Mickey James, Last Rodeo against Jordan Grace, uh, your your performance, by the way, again with Josh Alexander versus Bully Ray was one of the best commentated performances that i heard through uh, in a very long time but wow. kind of reflecting back on the full year and the show how has it been with impact wrestling this past year uh first of all thank you it's very very kind of you i don't get anywhere without my color commentator matthew raywalt my producer josh matthews and then scott demore who's been uh, amazing to me over the past year yeah i i would be lying if i said i wasn't a little emotional and definitely fired up going into this year's hard to kill Debuting it last year's Hard to Kill was uh, extremely emotional. I was unsure what the the, the the landscape of Impact was going to be like. I knew I'd have a lot of familiar faces around and uh, some new faces as well. So it was uh, nerve-wracking, I guess you could say, last year. And this year it was like, oh, this is not, you know you know, old hat or anything, but it's like, okay, we've, we've been here before, but let's just kill it. And to open and close the show, kind of like you said, we bookended the show so well with Bully Ray and Alexander and then uh, Mickey James and Jordan Grace. You, you can't ask for a better show. And then everybody else on the show just absolutely brought their A game. So uh, I said it a moment ago, but when Impact Wrestling is live, they don't miss. It's the best. And like you said, there was a lot of emotions, you know, right and high going into, uh, you know, hard to kill. And then uh, the, you had the taping over the past week, you know, in Impact Wrestling over the past year, you had one of the significant uh, people who made an impact in a shorter amount of time, Jay Briscoe, who we recently lost in the wrestling world. Kind of tell us about your kind of experiences having Jay in Impact Wrestling last year. Yeah, I, I wish I could say I'd gotten to know him better because the outpouring of love Love just speaks to what kind of person uh, he was. So everybody in Impact was heartbroken. I had the chance to meet him a couple of times. I think the first one was the uh, Multiverse of Matches in Dallas, and they had just worked FTR within a few hours of the show. So they're literally arriving, and he's still bleeding from the match against FTR. And then, uh, obviously, they win the titles at Under Siege. They have a great moment at Slammiversary. I mean... All my experiences with Jay and Mark is that they were just fun to be around, pleasant, professional. Um, everything was just spectacular. So it was definitely one of those situations where you wish you'd gotten to know them better. And any small tribute that we at Impact Wrestling could pay to Jay Briscoe's at a, a legendary career, uh, you know, it's it's a small it's a small thing. But at the end of the day, our hearts just go out to the entire Pew family uh, in the wake of what happened. And you did, uh, I have to also compliment you, you did a great job with the narration on uh, this past week's Impact on Access TV with the dedication to uh, Jay as well. But talking about Jay Bristle, you think about tag teams and you mentioned him earlier, Matthew Raywald is your tag team partner. And I, I got, you know, I have my guys over at True Hill Heat that do the watch along and they view you guys as one of the best commentary teams out there. How did you guys kind of develop this chemistry? I know you guys knew each other previously in WWE, but but it kind of seems like once Ray Wall came behind the commentary desk, it was like you found kind of the, the perfect partner to be alongside you. Yeah, it's been a long road because uh, it's funny just how things work out. In WWE, he was on the heels of the whole Rusev angle and wasn't really doing much. And I remember speaking to Michael Cole and a bunch of other people saying, hey, you know, Matt can talk. Aiden can talk, you know, at the time, Aiden English. And they gave him an opportunity on 205 Live, and eventually he and I did NXT UK together as well. So, you know, fast forward a number of years, and we're both in Impact Wrestling. 
uh, my former co-host, D'Lo Brown, was transitioning to more of a strictly off-camera and backstage role. So it was like, okay, well, who's going to be the new color commentator? And I was like, well, similar situation. Matthew was kind of on the heels of what had happened, ironically, at Hard to Kill 2022 of he had been backing up Deanna Perrazzo and they were you know, creatively moving in a different direction. And I was like, well, if he's available, I already know what he's like and it would be great to work with him. So uh, we did a taping towards the end of January 22 in Fort Lauderdale. And it was his first time doing commentary in about two years. Um, so it, for him, it was learn. Uh, for him, it was a relearning experience, and for me, it was you know kind of getting back in the groove a little bit because you know I still had six months away from wrestling. So I'd had D'Lo for literally one night, and then I think I worked with a dozen partners the night after, and then fast forward a handful of weeks, and I'm working with Raywalt again. So it took us a minute to kind of get our training wheels back on, so to speak. And I feel very confident in what we're doing right now. I, of course, we appreciate fans, uh, you know, saying whatever they want. Yeah, wrestling commentary is kind of in the eye of the beholder. You may hate me, but love somebody else just for whatever you know subjective reason. That's fine. Uh, but we believe we're doing you know the best work possible, and we're just trying to do right by impact. And kind of like learn about like how how does how is like the preparation before uh, what do you say like a pay, a live pay per view in comparison to one of those long TV tapings? How do you and Matt kind of get together and prepare for those type of like uh, commentary jobs? Yeah, uh, live pay per views, and I've spoken on this in the past when I was with WWE, are almost to call them easy is not accurate, but the prep for it is easy because. You've done your storytelling through the handful of weeks and the build up to whatever the live show is. So once you're there, it's the big fight scene at the end of the movie. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to it's easy to go out there and call Full Metal Mayhem with Josh Alexander and Bully Ray. And, you know, oh, Mickey James entire career is in the balance in the main event. You still have to bring it and, and nail it the day of. But those shows are a little bit simpler. I love to have my stats. I love to have my notes. And we have a great uh, historian and statistician named Garrett Kidney on staff with us at Impact. And he supplements my notes. And we work together and we bounce ideas off each other. Uh, but Ray Walt and I, you know, I wouldn't say we communicate a ton in between tapings or live shows. But the day of the show, we are constantly in communication bouncing ideas off of each other. And then especially during the tape days where there's elements of the show that you inherently can't see uh, because we're trying to film the in arena content as opposed to what's happening backstage. We have to rely on each other that we're on the same sheet of music and he's got my back, I've got his. And there's a lot of stories of things that we just don't see that are written in the shows and it's trying to bring those things forward. So the tape shows can often be much more complicated because it's not what you see, it's what you don't see that you're prepping for. Yeah. And I just like I said, you know, the chemistry that you have with Matt is it, it was instant once you guys got behind the table for Impact Wrestling and even during your time together in WWE. But you kind of have so many different partners throughout your commentary career with professional wrestling. Like, how do you adapt and how do you kind of play off the person next to you? And what do you, does anything in your job kind of change depending on your partner? Um, yes and no. I mean, you're, you're still trying to accomplish the same things. But uh, one thing I was always you know, taught by Michael Cole was just patience and adaptability. Um, you know, the next handful of weeks, and I think, you know, going forward, you're going to hear Gia Miller uh, on BTI which is great. Gia is relatively new to commentary. So she is learning. So th I have to approach that as somebody who needs a little bit more from me. I need, maybe need to do 70% of the call as opposed to 50. Uh, it, it just depends on the case and it depends on what somebody's strong suits are. I've worked with people uh, like Ray Walt who've had the opportunity to be on the biggest stage of them all and won championships. I've sat there with people like Byron Saxon who while was a wrestler at one point is known mostly to fans as a broadcaster. So there's certain things you can ask one person versus another. Same thing with what Michael Cole can ask Pat McAfee. He can't ask, uh, you know, Wade Barrett and vice versa. So there's yeah. just so many different layers to this that you just take the, the cards that you're dealt, so to speak, and you try and play the hand accordingly. And you talked a little bit about, you know, learning so much from Michael Cole. How is kind of that experience? You know, people see Michael Cole and he's been behind the desk for so many uh, years, but you got to kind of know him on a personal basis and learn from him with all the you know years of experience that he has. What was that kind of experience for you learning from Michael Cole behind the scenes? 
uh, instrumental. Um, Michael Cole is maybe the most important reason why I've had the success in wrestling and the longevity in wrestling that I've had to this point in time. And hopefully that continues for a while, but I, I wouldn't be where I am without Michael Cole. Uh, he kind of, to put it in a way is like an uncle <laughs> to me that always looked after me and, and mentored me and was straight with me and was honest with me and brutally honest with me in the best way possible. So um, I think the world of his ability, I think the world of him as a human being, uh, we've not been able to communicate a ton, uh, you know, since I um, was released from WWE, but, you know, he knows where I stand with him and vice versa. So uh, I'm very grateful to everything he taught me over the years. And I know in the past you kind of talked about two years ago the sh the shock of you know being released from WWE, but you you have bounced back in such a big way, and this is not the first time you've done this. Doing a little research on you, you know, during your your years before you got into wrestling, you were kind of questioning if broadcasting was for you, and then got the job at WWE. How do you kind of look back on those different situations? You know, being released from WWE and then coming to Impact Wrestling and then being in early in your broadcast career doing just you know football basketball different sports and then transitioning into wrestling i think it's any walk of life professionally personally is you're going to have peaks and valleys you're going to have doors that you wish would open to you but don't uh you have certain doors that open that you never really thought were going to be the right path for you and Sometimes it's okay to take that leap and give it a shot. Um, I've experienced that in so many different aspects of my life. So uh, for wrestling to have popped up the way that it did, you know, I was 23 years old. I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea. So I'm very fortunate that I had the people around me that, you know, gave me opportunities to succeed, to fail, to learn, to grow, to evolve because I needed that time. I needed to, you know, reinvent myself. And I had plenty of instances in WWE where, you know, it take one step forward and then two steps back. And it was just a matter of you know, just keep moving forward. And, and that's something I believe across everything in life is it can be really difficult. Sometimes there can be days where you, you don't feel it. You don't feel confident in yourself, but you're never going to get anywhere if you just stop, if you just quit. And uh, I'm a really persistent person, <laughs> uh, maybe to my own fault. And uh, I think that's a big reason why uh, I've gotten the impact. No, I think I think it's a it's a it's a great thing to have and a great trait to have because, you know, doing my research and reflecting back on your WWE career, I didn't realize how many times you were like the utility player, like the person they called on when they needed to fill a spot. Like, you know, like what do you what do you think was like the key factor in why they just always got back to you when they needed someone you were you like came through. You were kind of like their their workhorse, their MVP whenever they needed to fill in whether whether it's you know superstars or and Michael Cole is back in Saudi Arabia and you're filling in for SmackDown, whether it's a different show, you just always came through for them. So kind of reflecting back on how many different roles you played in WWE, what did you think was the reason why they always called on you? In in wrestling, much like in life, the big opportunities that you get rarely come when you're the most prepared for them. But you can still do everything humanly possible to be ready for them. Uh, again, I come back to Michael Cole. He taught me from the day we started working together. He said, watch every show, take notes, and be ready for anything. And sure enough, you hit the nail on the head. The pandemic rolls around in 2020, for instance. And I think I was on five out of six shows at one point. So if I hadn't done the homework to watch every weekly live program we had beyond that consume digital media and social media content, I'd have been dead in the water. And as a result, WWE would have had a need to fill. So I'm very grateful that they turned to me as often as they did. Uh, they went a different direction. And now I'm really happy that in Impact Wrestling, uh, that skill set that I developed, I can utilize in a lot of different fashions. And even for something like this, I can be called upon to represent the company. And that just means the world to me. And they have a great representative in you and coming up, like you said before, the next big show is No Surrender already lined up for that show is Mickey James versus Masha Slamovich for the Impact Knockouts World Championship. You were on the call for that tremendous main event matchup at Hard to Kill with Jordan Grace. Do you think that Mickey, you know, after surviving the, the last rodeo, is she ready for Masha Slamovich and the intimidating force where every... Uh, 
a lot of the impact fans that I speak to, they just say it's only a matter of time before she wins that world championship. Do you think that no surrender is going to be that time for Mickey? Um, I think Mickey James has a lot of things to get ready for. In I don't know uh, week to week how this is going to go for Mickey James. Um, there have been fans who pointed to what happened at Hard to Kill that it looked like she almost tapped out. Matthew Raywalt and I for sure thought she tapped out, but obviously the match continued. She defeated Jordan Grace, so uh, became the Knockouts World Champion. So uh, she's going to have to be ready. Come no surrender. Has never faced Masha Slamovich before. It's the first time of her matchup. Masha, in my opinion is the most ticked off person in impact wrestling because she went most of 2022 unbeaten in impact lost in a hell of a match at bound for glory against jordan grace lost in a last knockout standing match and is out to prove herself and when masha has something to prove it's like a dog with a bone so i i think mickey james is going to get all she can handle at no surrender we bring up Masha Slamovich. A lot of people also talk about another person that's hungry in like Steve Macklin. There, who would you say is like the impact wrestling star that people have to watch the most in this new year of 2023? Yeah, you, you stole it from me, but Steve Macklin, he's beaten nine for, uh, former world champions uh, in various different companies. So, I mean, his 2022 was stellar. He's also really ticked off and wants to get to the Impact World Championship. He's voiced that a number of times. Um, Steve Macklin is quickly becoming a pillar of Impact Wrestling, so people need to keep an eye out for him in 2023. I definitely agree with you there. I, I'm ready for the Steve Macklin, Josh Alexander uh, matchup. That's that's the one I'm like, I, I, I need impact. That would be amazing. Hey, let the mayhem begin. Let's do it. <laughs> but thank you so much, Tom, for your time. Please uh, let the people know where they can follow you on social media. Of course, you got Impact Plus, Impact Insiders, every way they can watch Impact Wrestling and hear you on the call. Yeah, for me on social media, Instagram and Twitter, at Tom Hannafin. Check out Impact Wrestling every Thursday night on Access TV in the U.S., in Canada, on Fight Network, and internationally on DAZN, I believe available in about 170 different countries where you have access to our live broadcasts, our weekly TV show, but also on top of that, uh, things like I, I got to watch today uh, an old match between Elix Skipper and Sanjay Dutt, just going back in the now 21-year history of TNA and Impact Wrestling. There's so many little treasures there that you can pull up uh, on a bevy of different platforms impact plus impacts ultimate insiders impacts insiders as well uh, we're available so there's a lot of different places you can get impact and for fans that want to get you know the zone and go into that long history of impact wrestling give them one gem maybe one gem maybe it's the Eli skipper match that you checked out what would you say is like one hidden gem that they might want to check out on the zone oh wow uh hidden gem uh Gosh, I, I can't point to like one specific match. I know that's something that I was a big fan of was uh, Magnus's world title run where a lot of that was shot in the United Kingdom, if you recall. Yes. Uh, Rockstar Spud was by his side. Samoa Joe was going crazy. Uh, the Beatdown Clan was a big part of that. So that's an era of Impact Wrestling where it's star-studded. Um, I'm blanking on what the year was, but it was something where I know I was paying very close attention, and especially when Magnus was getting that type of negative reaction in the UK. You yeah. know you're doing something right. It was really cool. I believe 2000, 2014 was that uh, Magnus running from that. Thank you. Era. Nick Aldis, for those who don't yes. remember Magnus, just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> different world, the different universe. Yes. There. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom, for your time here. Of course, everyone watching, comment down below. Let us know what you thought about the interview. If you got a question for Tom or anyone from Impact Wrestling, let us know in the comments down below as well. This has been True Heels BTR Between the Ropes with Tom Hannafin. Drop a thumbs up on the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe if you are new. I'm SP3, and we are out.